So now we're going to move to the cellular-based model of hemostasis that was first described in the late 1990s, early 2000s by Hoffman and Monroe. And so when there is a tear in the endothelium, there is release of tissue factor and von Willebrand factor that are present in granules in these cells. And tissue factor and von Willebrand factor are going to get the processes going. The first players on the scenes are the platelet. And von Willebrand factor, especially in the presence of turbulent blood flow, which is what is going to occur around the area of damaged endothelial cells, is it's going to anchor itself on one end to subendothelial collagen and then grab hold of the platelet on the other end. Uh, predominantly by binding a specific platelet receptor called the GP1B receptor. Through that anchoring, you're going to develop the initial platelet plug. And the action of the platelet binding to subendothelial collagen is called platelet adhesion. And so you should think about the generation of a clot in the same way as you think about building a house. And so you're going to start by building the scaffold and the scaffold's the platelet-rich plug. We're then going to start forming the fibrin. And you can think of fibrin as the cement. And tissue factor, which is the cofactor to factor 7A, is going to lead to activation of factor 10, which, as you remember, in the in vitro model was the rate-limiting step. Now, here it is also rate limiting. And so this conversion of factor 10 to 10A is what is going to ultimately lead to thrombin generation and formation of the fibrin-rich clot, which is the cement that then gets poured into the platelet-rich scaffold. And so tissue factor and factor 7A together uh, is a complex. Uh, so it's a serine protease factor 7A and the cofactor tissue factor that together is called the extrinsic tenase, sort of alluding to the in vitro model. This factor 10A is in the presence of factor 5A going to lead to conversion of factor 2 to 2A, which is thrombin, that is going to lead to the generation of the fibrin-rich clot. And this thrombin itself is also involved in a lot of crosstalk and it's going to bind to these platelet receptors that it's going to further activate other clotting factors, including factor 11, factor 8, and factor 5. Why is it doing this? Well, it is doing this because it's begun to form the fibrin-rich clot with that generation of the small amount of thrombin. But now there's lots of positive feedback loops that are occurring that is going to lead to that big thrombin burst that is the result of this very coordinated amplification phase. All of these clotting factors of the historical intrinsic pathway, but we now know it as the amplification pathway, is going to lead to the development of the intrinsic tenase, which is composed of factor 9A and factor 8A. All of this is going to lead to much greater amounts of thrombin that is then going to lead to activation of our clot stabilizers. But really importantly, we have to keep in mind that when you generate a clot or when you build a house, that there's lots of editing that occurs and lots of cross checks. A lot of those cross checks occur with important natural anticoagulants. One of these important natural anticoagulants is antithrombin that directly binds to and inhibits many serine proteases, many of these enzymes in the coagulation system. But it preferentially binds to thrombin 2A and factor 10A and inactivates them. There are other important regulators such as protein C, and its cofactor, protein S, that is going to very carefully regulate the cofactor function of factor five and factor eight. And so by down-regulating these and proteolytically degrading them, you're going to avoid excessive procoagulant activity. 